Okay, good afternoon. And Trico, we have beautiful weather out there today, a nice fall day. So uh, our first speaker is Farah Zia. She got her medical degree at George Washington University. Subsequently, she was a uh, clinical fellow here at NCI, and she's now a medical officer in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. Her title, Overview of Breast Cancer, Farah. All right, Terry, thank you. Um, looks like the mic is working. You guys can hear me. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, the topic today is breast cancer. It's a, a kind of a broad topic. So I'm going to try to uh, just touch on all the different areas that you might be interested in. So I think that people often forget these strides that we are actually making in cancer research. Uh, because unfortunately there are so many cancer deaths that we still see. So I thought what I would do is start by looking at how uh, breast cancer was yesterday and then talk a little bit about what it is today. <clears throat> so in 1975, the incidence rate for female breast cancer in the United States was 105 new cases diagnosed for every 100,000 women in the population. The mortality rate was 31 deaths for every 100,000 women. From 1975 to 1977, of those diagnosed with breast cancer, about 75% survived their disease about five years. Among white females, the relative survival rate was 76%, and among African Americans, it was 62%. <clears throat> In 1975, mastectomy was the only accepted surgical option for the treatment of breast cancer. Only one randomized trial of mammography for breast cancer screening had been completed. Several other trials and the joint NIH-ACS breast cancer detection demonstration projects were just beginning. Clinical investigation of combination chemotherapy using multiple drugs with different mechanisms of action and of hormonal therapy as post-surgical or adjuvant treatment for breast cancer was in its earliest stages. So listening to this, you can imagine these strides that we've made. <clears throat> In the mid-1970s, clinical evaluation of the drug tamoxifen um, as a hormonal treatment of breast cancer was just beginning. In the 1970s, no gene associated with an increased risk of breast cancer had been identified as of yet. So how about breast cancer today? For the years 2007 to 2011, the incidence rate for female breast cancer was 125 new cases diagnosed for every 100,000 women. Uh, the mortality, well actually, so I just want to point out that uh, the incidence rate uh, actually has gone up, but I would say that that's due more to early detection than the use of mammography we have. The mortality rate was 22 deaths for every 100,000 um, women. And 12.3% of women will be diagnosed at some point during their life. Um, and this is using data from 2009 to 2011. <clears throat> the breast cancer death mortality rate in the US has been declining steadily since 1989, when it peaked at a rate of uh, 33 deaths for every 100,000 women. Of those diagnosed between 2004 to 2010, 89.2% were expected to survive their disease at least five years. Among white women, the five-year relative survival rate was 91%. Among African-American women, it was 78%. The increase in breast cancer survival, um, as I said just now, uh, seen since the mid-1970s, has been attributed, attributed to both screening and improved treatment. So this... Uh, graph is showing incidence and mortality uh, by race, looking at the years 1975 to 2010. And for African American females, uh, we can see that the incidence rose sharply from 1975 to 1990. Then it reached a plateau. And for white females, the incidence has always been higher than African American females. It rose sharply between 1980 to 1985. Um, then more recently, the incidence has declined and reached a plateau. Mortality has been uh, slowly declining for both uh, African-American females and white females, uh, but there definitely remains a disparity and uh, African-American females do have a higher mortality. This graph is so showing uh, 
U.S. mortality rates for cancer of the breast and the lung and the bronchus using data from 1975 to 2010. Um, from 1975 to 1990, the mortality for lung cancer steadily increased and then reached a plateau uh, for both uh, white females and African-American females. The mortality rates for breast cancer have steadily declined since 1990, though again you are seeing that a clear disparity exists between white females and African-American females. Uh, for both uh, white females and African-American females, lung cancer though still is a higher mortality rate. So what is breast cancer? It is cancer that forms in the tissues of the breast and usually the ducts, um, and the ducts are the tubes that carry milk to the nipple, and, and the lobules as well, uh, they are the glands that make the milk. It occurs in both men and women, although male breast cancer it can happen, but it is rare. So this slide is showing you uh, the structure of the breast. <clears throat> the breast is composed mainly of fatty tissue. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. So fatty tissue, uh, which contains a network of lobes made up Effort of tiny tube-like structures. The quick change batteries that I mentioned earlier are contain, located underneath uh, this new larger plants. bucket seat. So these now are the lobes, the and within the lobes are the lobules. The first reason uh, is that by lifting the seat and up, it's there's tiny ducts that connect the glands, lobules, and lobes. The second reason is that and they the carry milk from the lobes to the nipple. Easy way to access the quick change batteries. All you have to do to get to them is simply grab the back of the seat, lift it, and boom, there the batteries are. Changing Blood and lymph vessels run throughout the breast. The the About 90% of all breast cancers start in the ducts or the lobes of the breast. Your new batteries and you're ready to go. New chargers and batteries are available for sale on Razor.com. All right, so what are we the areas that we want to talk about today? We want to talk about XL. assessing for risk factors for breast cancer. We want to talk about early detection. We want to talk about diagnosing breast cancer. Uh, then one. Age is a risk, risk factor. Uh, about 80% of breast cancer does uh, occur in postmenopausal women. Um, also, if you have had a prior breast cancer, that puts you at, a, at risk of having a second breast cancer. Also, if you have a high risk pre malignant lesion like lobular carcinoma in situ or atypical ductal hyperplasia, that will put you at, at increased risk. Also, XX. Excess endogenous or exogenous hormones, such as if a person has an early menarc or a late menopause, or if they take hormone replacement therapy, we know that is a risk for breast cancer as well. Uh, if you've uh, not ever had any children, you have a longer exposure to estrogen in your body that puts you at risk, or if you've had your first child at the age of greater than 35, you, you are, um, again, uh, exposing your body to more estrogen, and this is thought of as a risk. Women who have a history of breast biopsies, for example, it could be for fibrocystic disease or, or something like that, um, that, but that we know puts them at a higher risk of having breast cancer. Uh, patients who have radiation exposure before the age of 40, for example, there are patients who've had, we know cases who've had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma and they've been treated with uh, radiation to the mediastinum and uh, some cases have developed breast, breast cancer after that treatment. Uh, we think that mammographic, mammographic density, uh, dense breasts on mammograms is a risk factor. Uh, also lifestyle factors, alcohol, lack of exercise, obesity, and of course you know obesity, you produce more estrogen in the body. Family history is an important risk factor. If your mother, sister, or daughter has developed breast cancer before menopause, you are three times more likely to develop the disease. If two or more close relatives, for example, your cousins, your aunt, 
your grandmother have developed breast cancer, you are also at increased risk. We know that genetics uh, definitely plays a big role. Uh, breast cancers have been linked to mutations in specific genes that we know. Uh, BRCA1 is, uh, is related to familial, familial breast and ovarian cancer. BRCA2 is uh, linked to familial breast cancer. P53 and retinoblastoma 1, these are tumor suppressor genes, also linked to breast cancer. HER2 new, CRB2, CMYC, these are oncogenes, also linked to breast cancer. Um, women, women with mutations in P53 and BRCA1, they have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 85%. We're going to talk about early detection, and I do want to point out that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so you might want to share some of this information with a family member, your mother, your sister, an aunt. So the American Cancer Society guidelines for the early detection of breast cancer. So annual mammograms, uh, they recommend starting at age 40 and continuing as long as the woman is in good health. Uh, they recommend clinical breast exams every three years for women in their 20s and 30s and annually after the age of 40. Breast self-exam is an option for women starting in their 20s, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the breast self-exam, that's an opportunity for a woman to become familiar with her own body. So if there is a change, it can be detected quickly. Um, if one does it, it should begin at the age of 20, and it should continue monthly thereafter. <clears throat> so these are just some quick pictures to show you how a breast self-exam is done. You start by standing and looking uh, in the mirror with your shoulders straight, with your arms on the hips. You look uh, for any changes in size, shape, color. Uh, you look for things that are not good, like dimpling, puckering, inverted nipple, or any nipple discharge. And you do that also in the position with your arms raised above your head so you can take a good look under the armpits where there's also breast tissue. The next step is to uh, lie flat um, and fill your breast while lying down. You wanna use a firm, smooth touch. You wanna keep your fingers flat and together. Uh, you, there are different ways to do it, but one way is to use a circular motion and, but, the most important thing is you want to follow a pattern and you want to cover the whole breast. So you do this both lying down and standing up or sitting. So I said that the self-breast exam is an option, so I'll explain it here. In 2002, the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force recommended against teaching self-breast exams based on evidence indicating that uh, the self-breast exam did not reduce breast cancer mortality. The decision was largely based on one randomized clinical trial indicating no difference in breast cancer mortality after 10 years um, in Shanghai factory workers who were randomly assigned to receive self-breast exam instruction versus the control group. Um, and the same study showed that self-breast exams uh, resulted in more breast biopsies and diagnosis of benign lesions. Um, but I just have to say that most clinicians actually do still recommend the self-breast exam, I think it's a good way to, to pick up things in between your physician visits, which for most people are just annually or every three years if you're younger. But that is the data from a study. <clears throat> okay, as far as clinical exam, um, it should be performed by a doctor or trained nurse practitioner. The clinical breast exams have been uh, shown to decrease mortality based on evidence from the Canadian National Breast Screening Study. So, um, oops. So the clinical exam is recommended every two to three years between the age of 20 to 40 um, and annually for women over 40. So abnormal signs um, and symptoms. Um, so what are you looking for when you're doing uh, your own exams uh, or just you know, paying attention to yourself uh, during the year? You wanna make sure that there's no change in breast size, there's no pain or tenderness, Although I do have to point out that more, most breast cancers, there's no pain, there's no tenderness. Um, it's often a painless lump <clears throat> that may be able to be felt, it may not. It may be picked up on mammography. Uh, also redness, change in nipple position, 
scaling around the nipples, sore, um, sore breasts uh, that don't heal, puckering, dimpling, retraction, nipple discharge, thickening of skin, or lump or a knot, or a retracted nipple. So mammograms. Uh, mammograms can be used as a screening tool to detect early breast cancer in women experiencing no symptoms. Mammograms can also be used to detect and diagnose breast uh, disease in women experiencing symptoms such as a lump, pain, or nipple discharge. So we know that breast cancer screening mammography reduces mortality by 26% in women aged 50 to 74 uh, and 17% in, in women 40 to 49. Uh, there's probably a higher incidence rate of breast cancers in the 50 to 74 age group. Um, other modalities of screening in high-risk women, um, digital mammography, but in, a, in fact, I think most uh, institutions now do use digital mammography. Um, the, the advantage is that an electronic image is stored as a computer file, and the image can be enhanced, magnified, manipulated, so you can really get a good look of what's in there, as compared to the, the old films that people did. Um, we also use MRI, uh, especially in women who have um, a greater breast density, which makes mammography difficult. Um, but uh, so the MRI, it has sensitivity, um, is, it's higher than mammogram. Um, so it's more often positive in disease, but uh, the specificity for MRI is lower than MAMO. So you also end up with more false positives and more biopsies, and that's the downside. So diagnosis, how do we diagnose breast cancer? So biopsy obviously is necessary to ascertain whether a lesion is benign or cancerous and involves removing a sample of breast tissue. So there are several methods of breast biopsy these days. The most appropriate method depends on certain characteristics of a lesion, its size, its location, its appearance, um, and how it's accessible. So, uh, one of the most common ways is a fine needle aspiration. It's most often done on a palpable lesion when you can feel it where, uh, where the needle is going to go into. Um, it's a percutaneous biopsy using a fine gauge needle. And you can withdraw fluid from a cyst or it could take some cells from a, a solid mass. Uh, another technique is the core needle biopsy. Um, it is done uh, using mammography and ultrasound guidance. Uh, therefore, it can be used on non-palpable lesions. Um, a hollow spring-loaded device is fired into the breast, and uh, you get one sample per firing. So the poor patient is subjected to at least 10 to 20. They'll need at least 10 to 20 samples from the different areas within um, the lesion. So it's 10 to 20 times they'll have to fire this thing to get the samples. Um, then there is something called a vacuum biopsy. It's a mammotome biopsy is using a vacuum-assisted system. It's also guided by ultrasound guidance or stereotactic guidance. And stereotactic guidance is a two-angle x-ray, so you can see the lesion and where you're going. Uh, it's very quick. There's no pain. It's actually more commonly done these days than some of the other procedures. Um, it's three times more accurate uh, than core biopsy for early breast cancer. Um, it the reason for that is because uh, it takes a, a wide area of tissue and uh, it allows for sampling of microcalcifications. And microcalcifications are very often seen in early breast cancer. Uh, then there is the ABBI method, which is called, which is automated stereotactical uh, surgical biopsy. And uh, this um, cannula, it's a large cylinder, and uh, the good thing about it, again, is it takes a su sufficient amount of tissue in one pass through the lesion, uh, and uh, it, it's able to take, uh, the, the cylinder is large enough that you're able to take a sampling surrounding the uninvolved area, which is, which is good. And then open surgical biopsy is done by a general surgeon in the operating room, which is also, I guess, a good technique. Uh, uh, in that you're able to get the whole lesion and you're able to get normal tissue surrounding. This is just uh, a picture of a um, device for the vacuum-assisted or mammotome biopsy. 
<clears throat> uh, this is just a picture showing you, um, you know, like I said earlier, that sometimes uh, lesions are not palpable, but they're picked up on mammogram. And therefore, uh, the interventional radiologist who's going to do the biopsy will need ultrasound gu guidance in order to locate the lesion. And here you just see what the breast mass will look like on ultrasound, and you'll see the, ne the needle approaching it for the biopsy. Sometimes uh, something is seen on mammogram, and it turns out to be a cyst. And uh, so oftentimes mammograms are followed up by ultrasounds to see whether the, the lesion is a sol solid lesion or a cystic lesion. Um, and here uh, you see an ultrasound how a cyst will look on ultrasound. Uh, it's biopsied, and if the fluid that's withdrawn from the cyst is clear, it's most often benign, and cysts are most often benign. But if it's bloody, then you'll have to be concerned for a malignancy. But that's not often the case in breast cancer. So what are the types of breast cancer? Um, so as you know, a pathologist will review the biopsy to give a final pathological diagnosis. So uh, ductal, car <coughs> ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, these are types of non-invasive breast cancer, DCIS and LCIS. So DCIS is the most common type of non-invasive breast cancer. The cancer is only in the ducts, and it has not spread through the wall of the ducts into the tissue of the breast. And nearly all women with cancer at this stage can be cured. Um, it's the best, the best form of early detection for this lesion is with a mammogram, because DCIS is non-palpable, and it's asymptomatic, and like I said, it's routinely picked up. You know, if a woman comes and has a routine mammogram, um, and often, these are the lesions that are the reason for the, we are seeing increased incidence of breast cancer, but, you know, we are picking them up early, and they're treatable and curable. Globular carcinoma in situ, uh, this condition begins in the milk glands, uh, but does not go through the wall of the lobules into the breast tissue. And although it's not a true cancer, it does increase your risk of developing a cancer later in life. So it's important that women who do have uh, lobular carcinoma in situ follow up with regular mammograms. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so as far as invasive breast cancer, again, you've got uh, invasive ductal carcinoma, IDC, and invasive lobular carcinoma, ILC. So IDC, this is the second most common type of breast cancer, um, accounting for 8 out of 10 invasive breast cancers. Um, it starts in the duct, it breaks through the duct wall, and it invades into the tissue. That's why it's invasive. From there, it may enter into the lymphatics and spread to other parts of the body. Uh, from the lobules, it can go through the wall again and into the breast tissue, and then it can enter the lymphatics. But LC, um, ILC accounts for only one-tenth of the invasive cancers. We do really see a lot of uh, IDC in the community. Uh, inflammatory breast cancer, so what is that? Well, it's rare. It only accounts for 1 to 5 percent of all breast cancer cases in the United States. It's the most aggressive form of breast cancer. And the symptoms uh, include a, a diffuse erythema involving the majority of the breast, uh, peau d'orange, which is uh, the breast looking like uh, the skin of an orange. It'll have an erysipeloid edge, which is redness at the edge. Oftentimes, there is no palpable mass. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this type of breast cancer has a significantly lower overall survival uh, rate. <laughs> Compared with other types of breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer tends to be diagnosed at younger ages. Uh, we know that the median age is 57 years compared with a median age of 62 for other types of breast cancer. Um, it is more common um, and diagnosed at younger ages in African-American women. Um, the median age at diagnosis in the African-American population is 54, and that's compared with a median age of 58 in uh, white females. Inflammatory breast tumors are frequently hormone receptor negative, uh, which means that hormone therapies uh, are not uh, effective in these, in these cancers. Uh, and inflammatory breast cancer is more common in obese women than in women of normal weight. So what is the, what causes the inflammatory breast cancer? Well, we don't know what causes it, but the appearance 
the appearance is caused by the rapidly accumulating malignant cells that infiltrate and clog the lymphatic vessels in the skin of the breast, uh, which are the dermal lymphatics. And the blockage in the lymphatic vessels causes, uh, that's what causes the appearance of the swollen and the dimpled uh, skin and the classic signs that we're seeing in inflammatory breast cancer. So what are the guidelines developed by an international panel of experts? Um, so the minimum criteria for diagnosis uh, is the following. So patients often see, uh, when, you, when you're talking to a patient, uh, this is the history that you often get from, from them, a rapid onset of erythema uh, and swelling and a peau de range appearance and or abnormal breast warmth. Uh, sometimes they can feel a lump, but most often not. And usually the symptoms last less than six months, or they have seen it for less than six months. Uh, oftentimes the erythema can cover uh, at least a third or more of the breast. <clears throat> and the initial biopsy samples will often show invasive carcinoma. This is a picture of uh, somebody with inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, this is an African-American female. You probably cannot appreciate the erythema but you can see the peau de range look, the, the skin that's dimpled and looks like an orange peel. Very classic. Uh, these are also uh, varied presentations of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, I have to say that oftentimes it goes misdiagnosed because physicians, especially primary care physicians, seem to think it's a mastitis. I have seen too many unfortunate cases where patients will come in maybe six months after having these symptoms after being treated by antibiotic after antibiotic for a mastitis. Um, especially, unfortunately, in women um, uh, who've had a recent pregnancy and are, you know, uh, nursing uh, babies, I, I think that a lot of physicians will think, well, it's a mastitis. But sometimes pr uh, breast cancers do show up post-pregnancy. So very unfortunate, but you have to be on thinking all the time. This is something not good. So what is the prognosis for inflammatory breast cancer? Because inflammatory breast cancer usually develops quickly and spreads aggressively to other parts of the body, women diagnosed with this disease in general do not survive, unfortunately, as long as, as those diagnosed with other types of breast cancer. Um, the five-year relative survival for women uh, with this um, the statistics have shown from 1988 through 2001, it was 34%. And that's compared with a five-year uh, relative survival of 87% with women who have been diagnosed with other types of invasive breast cancer, uh, most commonly the IDC. All right, so staging. Um, once a cancer is diagnosed, it has to be staged. Um, so staging is a way of describing a cancer such as the size of a tumor and if or where it has spread. Staging is the most important tool doctors have to determine a patient's prognosis. And also the stage of the cancer dictates what kind of treatment options a patient has. Um, just briefly, I'll go through the staging. Um, so stage zero, it's known as uh, the carcinoma in situ. Um, the cancer has not spread past the ducts or the lobules and it's a non-invasive cancer. Stage one, the tumor uh, is less than or equal to two centimeters and it, there's no lymph node involvement. Stage two A, less than or equal to two centimeters, uh, but it can involve up to one to three lymph nodes, or it could be uh, between two and five centimeters, but it still has not um, spread to the lymph nodes. Um, or you can see no lesion in the breast, but you still could have one to three nodes, and that's still a stage two A. Stage 2B, uh, it's going to be, it could be between 2 and 5 centimeters, but it has also spread to between 1 and 3 lymph nodes, or greater than 5 centimeters and no lymph node involved. 3A, uh, you can see uh, nothing in the breast, uh, or you can see any size tumor and up to 4 to 9 lymph nodes. Uh, or you can see a tumor that's greater than 5 centimeters, and you can see small clusters of cancer cells in the lymph nodes. Um, or greater than five centimeters and one to three lymph nodes. Staging is always changing. It has changed so many times. They're continually refining the stages. And stage 3B, uh, the tumor may be any size, but has spread to the chest wall and or skin of the breast, causing swelling or ulceration. 
Uh, it also may involve up to nine lymph nodes. <clears throat> uh, so inflammatory breast cancer is at least a stage 3B at diagnosis. Uh, stage 3C, you can see no evidence of any disease in the breast or, or the tumor may be of any size and the cancer may have spread to the skin or chest wall causing ulceration. And you can also see 10 or more axillary, axillary lymph nodes or uh, you can also see lymph nodes above or below the collarbone, which is also known as the uh, supracop. Stage four breast cancer, um, stage four, it's, um, so breast cancer can be any size, but it has spread to distant uh, parts of the body, and uh, the more common places for breast cancer to go um, are bones, lungs, liver, chest wall, or brain. So what is the lymphatic system? Uh, <coughs> the lymphatic system is part of the circulatory system. And it comprises a network of lymphatic vessels that carry a clear fluid called lymph toward the heart. And the lymph nodes, they're part of the lymphatic system. They're small round clumps of immune cells that are part of the, uh, the whole system. They act as filters and they remove foreign materials such as bacteria and cancer cells. So here uh, you can see uh, cancer cells that are escaping into the lymphatics. Uh, from the lymphatics, you know they can travel through the body. Uh, at the top, you see a normal duct, then you see a, a non-invasive cancer, and at the bottom, you see an invasive cancer that has broken through the duct wall and is now getting into the lymphatic channels and into the lymph node. <clears throat> so what are the uh, lymph nodes that are commonly involved in breast cancer? Uh, they are the supraclavicular chain, the axillary chain, and the internal mammary chain. So let's talk about axillary lymph node dissection. So this is a traditional procedure for staging breast cancer. It, in, it involves removing 10 to 30 lymph nodes in the armpit closest to the tumor. Uh, the benefits of doing a full axillary dissection are that all of the lymph nodes can be examined for cancer. Um, it's a reliable determination whether cancer is spreading. Uh, but the drawbacks here, uh, there's always drawbacks to everything. Um, is that it could cause post-surgical complications such as lymphedema, infection, nerve damage, nerve damage from the surgery. Um, well, when there's lymphedema, that could result in infection and, and it could really be cumbersome. So let's talk about sentinel nodes. Uh, the term sentinel is derived from the French word sentinel, which means to guard over or vigilance. Um, the sentinel, sentinel lymph node is the first node that lymphatic fluid passes through in a group of lymph nodes. It is the protective node that acts as the first filter for harmful material. A sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, it's a less invasive method to determine if axillary nodes contain cancer with few, uh, fewer complications uh, than a full axillary dissection. During surgery, isosulfan blue and or technetium 99 is injected near the tumor or under the nipple. The tracer and dye mix with fluids uh, that travel to the lymph node and the sentinel, sentinel node is the first node that receives the drainage. Uh, so that one is removed and it's sent for pathological review and if cancer is present, then the surgeon will take out more lymph nodes. If there's no cancer, then no more lymph nodes are taken and the patient is spared all the uh, problems with the full dissection. Uh, so we know that sentinel lymph node dissection accurately identifies nodal metastasis of early breast cancer, but it's not clear whether uh, if you go ahead and do further nodal dissection, does, is it, does it affect survival? Is it better in the long run? So there was a phase three randomized clinical trial that was done. Um, it was conducted to determine the effects of complete <laughs> nodal dissection on survival of patients with uh, sentinel lymph node mets. So it was, this uh, study was open at 115 sites and it, it enrolled uh, back, back from May 1999 to December 2004. Uh, patients with invasive breast cancer uh, but no palpable adenopathy uh, and one to two sentinel lymph nodes containing mats were, that were identified by frozen section, uh, touch prep or H&E, stain on permanent sections. Uh, uh, they were the patients on the study. Um, so those who uh, had sentinel lymph node mats, they were uh, 
randomized to either getting a full axillary dissection of 10 or more nodes or to no, no further treatment all, at all. And the primary uh, endpoint of this uh, trial was overall survival. The secondary endpoint was disease-free survival. Results showed that at a median follow-up of 6.3 years, a five years overall survival was 91.8% with a full axillary dissection and 92.5% with just the central node. The five-year disease-free survival was 82.2% with axillary and 83.9% with the central node. And these results were statistically significant. Um, so the conclusion was that among patients with limited uh, sentinel mets, um, breast cancer treated with breast conservation and systemic therapy, the use of only taking the sentinel node alone compared with axillary dissection did not result in inferior survival. So it's OK just to spare the patient and just do the sentinel node. So prognosis. Um, prognosis uh, is the likely outcome for a patient diagnosed with cancer, and it is often viewed as the chance that the cancer will be treated successfully and that the patient will recover completely. Many factors can influ influence a cancer patient's prognosis, including the type and location of the cancer, the stage of the disease, the patient's age, and overall general health and the extent to which the patient's disease re responds to treatment. So treating the cancer, these are the different um, things that we have to work with. <clears throat> so what are the basic factors that doctors will consider in planning breast cancer treatment? Again, they'll look at the stage of the disease, the pathological grade of a tumor, uh, which can range from one to three, uh, three being more aggressive, um, hormone receptor status, they look at HER2 status, the patient's age and general health, the patient's menopausal status, and the presence of known mutations. Uh, so as far as treating early stage disease uh, for both DCIS and early stage invasive breast cancer, doctors generally recommend surgery to remove the tumor. To ensure that the entire tumor is removed, the surgeon will also remove a small area of tissue around the tumor. Although surgery aims to remove all of the cancer, it is known that many times microscopic cells can be left behind, either in the breast or elsewhere. So what is the next step in treatment after surgery? The next step in the management is to lower the risk of recurrence um, and to get rid of any hidden cancer cells that remain, and this is called adjuvant therapy. Adjuvant therapies include radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy. Um, the need for adjuvant therapy is determined based on an estimate of the chance of the residual cancer in the breast or the body, uh, uh, the chance of recurrence. Although adjuvant therapy lowers the risk of recurrence, it definitely does not necessarily eliminate them. As far as uh, inflammatory breast cancer, uh, the, the treatment steps, I um, just want to make mention that it's a multimodal approach. Inflammatory breast cancer is treated first with systemic chemotherapy to help shrink the tumor, as opposed to the normal routine um, of surgery followed by adjuvant therapy. So in this case, we, we do systemic chemotherapy, then uh, that's followed with surgery to remove the tumor, and then followed by radiation therapy. Uh, and then we, the clinical trials have shown that there is better responses to therapy and longer survival with this approach. Um, so metastatic uh, breast cancer, uh, what are the goals of treatment here? So as you know, it is a stage four cancer. It's non-curable at this point. So pro prolongation of survival is uh, the goal. Uh, we want to improve the quality of life for the patients. And uh, we want to improve their symptoms. But part of improving the quality of life is that you don't want to give medications that are so toxic that are that are more debilitating, debilitating to the patient than the disease itself. So in, breast, in the case of breast cancer, we do have the option of hormonal therapy. And if that is uh, the case for patients, that is what we prefer to do first. Um, if chemotherapy is what we need to do, we prefer to use single agent therapy in metastatic disease as opposed to combination chemotherapy. Let's talk about hormone therapy. So targeting the estrogen pathway, well, estrogen is a well-recognized growth factor for the majority of breast cancers. Uh, that makes it a, <clears throat> a very lucrative um, preventive, preventive target and for treatment as well. 
Um, so estrogen pathway can be targeted in two ways. Uh, you can use drugs that work um, at the receptor, uh, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, which include tamoxifen and raloxifene. Uh, and uh, you can also use agents that interfere with estrogen synthesis. And uh, the, for example, the aromatase inhibitors, uh, the GNRH analogs, and you can do oophorectomy. Um, the aromatase inhibitors, they inhibit aromatase, which is an enzyme found in peripheral tissues, uh, such as uh, the fat, the liver, the muscle, the brain. Uh, aromatase will convert uh, androstenedione and testosterone to, uh, eventually to estradiol, which, could, uh, which would go and interact with the estrogen receptor. So aromatase inhibitors block the enzyme and block the production of estradiol. Uh, tamoxifen will act at the receptor. Um, tamoxifen is uh, a agonist on the bone and the uterus, um, and it's an antagonist at the breast. So uh, with the uterus, you have to worry about, uh, since it's an agonist over there, you do have to worry about uterine cancers, and that is the downside to treating with tamoxifen. Uh, Raloxifene is often actually uh, used uh, both in treatment and in prevention. It's an agonist on the bone. It acts like a estrogen on the bone, which is good because it can be used for osteoporosis. Uh, but it's an antagonist uh, on the breast and the uterus, uh, which again is good for the uterus. It's good because you don't have to worry about um, developing uterine cancer with raloxifene. So it is. It's a good agent for prevention um, and for patients who uh, want to prevent osteoporosis, but also have a high-risk family history of uh, breast cancer. <clears throat> All right, so I just want to make mention that uh, they, at, NC at NCI, we have developed a tool that weighs the benefits and risks of raloxifene or tamoxifen to prevent breast, breast cancer. Um, and um, so although studies have shown that tamoxifen and raloxifene can both be used to reduce the risk of developing invasive breast cancer in high-risk women, the drugs can also cause adverse side effects. Um, I didn't mention uh, tamoxifen. The other side effects you have to worry about are blood clots, uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. So these are not minor side effects. You, you do only want to give it to patients if you have to, if that's your choice. So women and their physicians must decide whether the potential benefits of one or the other drug outweigh the risks in each patient's particular situation. So researchers from the NCI um, in the DCP and DCCPS, they led a study from which they have developed a benefit risk index to help guide decisions on whether postmenopausal women at increased risk should take either drugs. So the researchers um, who led the study, they used data from previous prevention studies and uh, they considered uh, possible adverse effects, like I just mentioned, uh, bone fractures, blood clots, stroke, endometrial cancer, rates of which were um, potentially increased or decreased by tamoxifen or raloxifene. They then assigned a weight to each possible adverse outcome and to uh, invasive and in situ breast cancer. And then they calculated the probability that a woman with a particular risk factors would have each outcome in five years with or without taking these medications. So they use these calculations to create a color-coded uh, color coded tables for each drug that show that for each age group um, and five-year projected risk of invasive cancer, whether there is strong or moderate evidence that the benefits outweigh the risks or that the risks outweigh the benefits for that particular patient. So this is being used clinically. Um, this is just some data showing you that uh, tamoxifen uh, definitely uh, is beneficial. It does reduce uh, the risk of reoccurrence. So let's uh, talk about tamoxifen pharmacogenetics. Um, it's been a few years now that this has been out, but uh, we now know that the growth inhibitory effects of tamoxifen is mediated by its metabolites. Uh, 4-hydroxytamoxifen and endoxifen. Um, the formation of these active metabolites is catalyzed by the uh, P450 uh, enzyme, P450-2D6-CYP2D6 enzyme. 
So approximately 100 CYP 2D6 genetic variants have been identified. Uh, these manifest in the population as four distinct phenotypes. Um, so people can be either have normal activity of, uh, of this or reduced activity or no activity or high activity. So it can be speculated that genotype-related differences in the form, uh, formation of active metabolites influence, influence therapeutic response to tamoxifen. So everybody is different in how they metabolize uh, tamoxifen and how they uh, will respond to it. As far as aromatase inhibitors, uh, there are three that are approved by the FDA, anastrozole, electrozole, and exemestane. Um, Exemestane uh, is an aromatase inhibitor which had been used to treat early and advanced stage breast cancer. And um, they discovered that it substantially reduced the risk of invasive breast cancer in postmenopausal women at high risk of developing the disease. Uh, the MAP3 trial, they looked at uh, 4,560 high risk postmenopausal post women and they randomly assigned them to receiving either exemestane daily for five years or getting a placebo. And those who received exemestane, they see that 11 women developed invasive breast cancer, and of those who received placebo uh, in five years, uh, 32 women developed invasive breast cancer. So the key points from the, from the MAP3 trial were that women who took exemestane were 65% less likely than women who took a placebo to develop breast cancer. This is the largest reduction in risk seen in any of the prevention trials uh, that have been done to date. Um, in previous trials, daily use of tamoxifen or raloxifene reduced breast cancer by 50% and 38% in five-year follow-up. So data from this trial indicates that exemestane may provide another option for breast cancer risk reduction. The trial did not reveal any serious side effects, such as those for tamoxifen. And the follow-up for this trial is ongoing. They need a longer follow-up. It is still not uh, actually approved, FDA approved as a preventative agent. <clears throat> so systemic adjuvant chemo. Um, so here in the graphs, um, so they're showing uh, re reduction in uh, recurrence and mortality in the two age groups, age less than 15, age 50 to 69. And so the, both age groups do benefit from the polychemotherapy, but the greatest reduction in recurrence and mortality is seen in those that are less than 50 years old. So polychemotherapy is usually what we do uh, as adjuvant chemotherapy when we're trying to, um, trying for, to go for a cure. And it definitely has benefit over single agent therapy. So this is just uh, looking at systemic chemotherapy and showing uh, that different types of breast cancer have different sensitivities to chemotherapy. Uh, we can see that those um, breast cancers that are endocrine dependent or hormone dependent, they are more chemotherapy resistant. And those that are endocrine independent or hormone independent, they are more chemotherapy sensitive. So all of these things are taken into account when, when physicians uh, make a decision of treatment. Here I just listed some chemotherapies. You can take a look at them. Uh, so HER2, uh, so it's a member of the membrane-spanning type 1 receptor uh, tyrosine kinase family, uh, comprising four closely related family members. They dimerize upon ligand stimulation and transduce their signals by subsequent autophosphorylation. They're catalyzed by the receptor tyrosine kinase activity. Uh, this results in recruitment of downstream signaling, and the incidence of RB2 amplification is about 30% in breast cancer. Therefore, it is a, a definite th therapeutic target. Um, HER2, uh, or trastuzumab, <clears throat> uh, it targets, uh, trastuzumab uh, targets the HER2 protein. It has a high affinity and specificity. Uh, it is 95% human, 5% murine. Um, this decreases the potential for immunogenicity. It increases potential for recruiting immune effector mechanisms. Uh, it was approved for early stage breast cancer in 2005. It, when you add it to chemotherapy, it increases overall survival and increases disease-free survival. And this is just a, a graph that again shows you that when you add Herceptin 
to chemotherapy, uh, you improve disease-free sur survival significantly in patients uh, that are HER2 new positive. Triple negative breast cancer. Um, it refers to specific subtype of breast cancer that does not express the genes for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2. It is diagnosed more frequently in younger women, African Americans, Hispanics, women with BRCA1 mutations. It's clinically characterized as more aggressive. It's less responsive to standard chemotherapy. Uh, it's associated with a poor overall uh, prognosis. Um, you can see from this uh, graph that uh, survival as compared to luminal A, which is a typical invasive ductal carcinoma, survival for triple negative drops uh, steeply uh, after about uh, 60 months. So here we're looking at <clears throat> I'm just going to skip this. Platinum agents. Uh, so these are just agents. Uh, we know that platinum agents are more effective in triple negative breast cancer. Uh, Bepalone is also has been shown to be a good agent in triple negative breast cancer. There's so many. There's so few treatment options uh, with these patients, unfortunately. So how can we do better? Um, so we definitely need better selection of chemotherapy regimens and gene expression profiling to predict response to particular agents. We need a better selection of patients for treatment with chemotherapy. We need to treat only those patients who are most likely to recur and who will therefore benefit from the addition of chemotherapy. Um, so that brings us to the Taylor X trial. I guess I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a pre-surgical chemotherapy that allows for uh, assessment of tumor response because you're giving it before the lesion has actually been surgically removed. So you're actually seeing if the chemotherapy is effective or not at reducing the size of the lesion. We often use this both in clinical and research settings. Uh, recently, uh, last year, ODAC um, uh, approved uh, voted to approve Genentech's uh, pertuzumab for neoadjuvant treatment in, in patients with high risk for two positive early stage breast cancer. Um, and this uh, recommendation was based on two phase two studies. Um, and uh, so uh, actually pertuzumab is on its way to becoming the first neoadjuvant breast cancer treatment approved in the US and the first treatment approved based on pathological complete response uh, I think it was like 33% of the patients from the trial showed a pathological complete response um, with this agent. So full approval is still pending and data are expected in 2016 from a study that's ongoing. So an important question in breast cancer treatment, what is the likelihood of distant recurrence in patients with breast cancer who have no involved lymph nodes and estrogen receptor positive tumors? These patients' prognosis is poorly defined uh, by histopathological and clinical measures. So what do we do with these patients? So Oncotype DX, this is uh, a multi-step approach uh, that was used it, we, to develop an assay for the expression of tumor-related genes for use with paraffin-embedded tumor tissue. Um, so an RT-PCR method was developed to quantify gene expression with paraffin-embedded tumor tissue. 250 candidate genes were selected from published literature, genomic databases, and experiments based on DNA arrays done on, uh, on frozen tissue. Data was analyzed um, on 447 patients um, to test the relationship bet between gene, uh, gene expression and the recurrence of breast cancer. Then they used the results of the three studies to select a panel of 16 cancer-related genes and five reference genes. Um, these were the ones with the best RT-PCR performance and the most ro robust predictions. They designed an algorith algorithm based on the levels of expression of these genes to compute a recurrence score for each tumor sample being tested. Um, then they had to validate the test, uh, and then they used paraffin-embedded tissue samples from patients who were previously enrolled in the B14 trial, um, and they used that to validate the ability of the uh, uh, 21 gene RT-PCR assay and the recurrence score algorithm to quantify the likelihood that these patients would recur uh, distantly. So
so the patients from the NSABB, NSABP B14 trial, they were node negative, they were ER positive, they were early stage breast cancer patients who had been previously treated with tamoxifen. So these are the patients we don't know. They have a good prognosis, but do, they, do we need to give them chemotherapy? That's the question. Or can we just give them hormonal therapy? So here we see that the, uh, the risk score that was provided by the Oncotype DX assay appears to actually provide an accurate estimate of the chance of recurrence by risk category. When they looked at the patients from the B14 trial, they saw that those who were placed into a low risk category and they followed these patients for 10 years, those patients had a low rate of distant recurrence and those who were placed in a high risk category per the Oncotype DX assay, they actually did have a high rate of distant recurrence at 10 year follow up. So based on this study, the recurrence score has been validated um, as uh, quantifying the likelihood of distant recurrence in the tamoxifen treated patients with node negative ER positive breast cancer. <clears throat> so patients with tumors that have a high recurrence score have a large absolute benefit of chemotherapy. So the more likely you are to recur, uh, you, you will have a, uh, a higher benefit from chemotherapy. That's clear. And patients with tumors that have low recurrence scores, uh, they have minimal benefit, if any, from chemotherapy. And that's clear. <clears throat> Okay, so there's ongoing research using results from the Oncotype DX assay. The Taylor X assay, as I mentioned before, um, it's a trial assigning individualized options for treatment. And then there's another ongoing trial that's using data from the Oncotype DX assay. That's the uh, SWOG RX Ponder trial. So running out of time, but uh, Taylor X is a landmark trial. It represents the culmination of a major initiative to integrate molecular diagnostic testing into clinical decision making. Uh, the primary objective is to determine whether adjuvant hormonal therapy is not inferior to chemo hormonal therapy in women with a mid-range Oncotype DX score. So these are the patients we don't know what to do with. Like I said, the ones who have a, a low score, we know they're not gonna benefit from chemotherapy. The ones that have a high score, we know they will benefit from chemotherapy. What do you do with the patients who have an intermediate range score? Do you give them chemo? Do you not give them chemo? Um, that's the, the Taylor X is going to answer some of these questions. Um, so they're also going to create a tissue and specimen bank for patients enrolled in this trial uh, to include tumor specimens, tumor uh, tissue microarrays, plasma, and DNA from peripheral blood. So NCI is using Oncotype DX to identify and assign treatment to more than uh, 10,000 breast cancer patients from 1,500 sites in the U.S., Canada, and Peru. And uh, accrual was completed in 2010, but the research is ongoing, and results should be around the corner in 2015. Um, so that this is the schema for the Taylor RX, uh, so I'm not going to go into that. But the key points, uh, it's going to examine whether genes that are frequently associated with recurrence for women with early stage breast cancer can be used to assign patients to the most appropriate and effective treatment. So can genes predict treatment? The results of this trial could eventually spare many women the unnecessary toxicity of chemotherapy. Uh, at, at this point, we really don't know what to do with a, group, a certain group of patients uh, who are in the mid-range. Um, most of them do end up getting chemotherapy. Uh, and so it is one of the first trials to examine a methodology to personalize cancer treatment. And this is the other trial that's ongoing right now. It's a key trial. Uh, it's evaluating the use of adjuvant endocrine therapy with or without chemo in patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So uh, specifically, this trial is going to look at women with recurrent scores from the Oncotype DX assay, less than or equal to 25, and one to three positive nodes. Again, mid-range scores, and the question is, these are hormone receptor positive patients. Do they need chemotherapy? Approximately 9,400 uh, patients will be screened in order to randomize 4,000, and again, it's currently ongoing. We are still waiting for answers. Uh, the MPAC trial, I just want to let you know what we, are doing in, um, what we are doing in the DCTD clinic right now. 
So our clinic uh, launched a trial in January 2014. The purpose is to assess whether assigning treatment based on specific gene mutations can provide benefit to patients with metastatic solid tumors. Uh, during the screening process, um, uh, samples of tumors from patients with various cancers will be genetically sequenced to look for a total of 391 different mutations in 20 genes. Uh, if mutations of interest are detected, those patients will be enrolled in the trial and randomly assigned to one of two treatment arms. Uh, one arm is going to get a targeted treatment particular to their gene mutation, and the other treatment arm is going to get another non-targeted therapy, which is uh, a good choice therapy, but not targeted to the mutation. Uh, patients who progress on arm B are uh, allowed to cross over to A. So what we don't know is whether using this approach is really effective at providing clinical benefit. Uh, most tumors, you, you know, as you know, have multiple mutations, and it is often not clear which one is, you know, you need to target in order to achieve the maximal benefit. Um, once a gene is mutated, it can lead to the activation of multiple pathways. Uh, so. The trial that we're doing in our clinic, the, the IMPACT trial, is designed to de determine whether people with specific mutations will benefit from specifically chosen targeted interventions and if these interventions lead to better outcomes. Um, do I have time to just finish the last four slides? Or So tomorrow, okay, ending with just a few slides. Um, so what are the goals in breast cancer research? I just want to finish with that. So we will use our rapidly increasing knowledge in the fields of cancer genomics and cell biology to develop more effective and less toxic treatments for breast cancer and improve our ability to identify cancers that are more likely to reoccur. Um, this is exemplified by the Oncotype DX assay. So we will use this knowledge to tailor breast cancer therapy to the individual patient. That is the key. That's what we're interested in right now. This is what the early drug development clinic is focused on, is targeted therapy. Um, for example, uh, gene expression analysis has led to the identification of five subtypes of breast cancer that have distinct biological features, clinical outcomes, and response to chemo. This knowledge can be exploited in the development of treatment strategies based on the specific characteristic of a particular woman's tumor. Not tumors in general, but a specific woman's tumor. And then this is exemplified by the Taylor X um, trial that I talked about a minute ago. Um, so furthermore, a patient's response to chemo is influenced not only by the genetic characteristics of their tumor, but also by inherited variations in genes that affect the body's ability <laughs> to absorb, metabolize, and eliminate drugs. Our knowledge will enable us to predict tumor responses to individual chemotherapy drugs or classes of drugs as well as the likelihood of severe adverse events from them. So this is specifically to each patient. So different patients metabolize drugs in different ways, and when we know uh, the variations, we will know which patients are better responders than others. And this is exemplified by the studies on endoxin. Uh, we will use our increasing knowledge of the immune system to enhance the body's ability to recognize and destroy cancer cells. Our current knowledge has facilitated the development of several promising breast cancer treatment vaccines that are currently under clinical investigation. And uh, okay, I guess I'm done. <laughs> but that was almost my last slide. Um, I definitely want to say that we will strive to understand, address, and eliminate factors that contribute to the higher mortality expressed by African American females. Because I think there are several sl slides that I showed you that disparities greatly exist. So we'd like to understand more about that. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a reality with, um, you know, Herceptin on top of the fact that anthracyclines definitely cause cardiotoxicity. Um, but you have to look at the benefits and the risks of treatment. And, the, and patients, I guess, who, who need a treatment, I think uh, you have no choice. But some of the studies that are being done right now, I think definitely there is a need to eliminate chemotherapy in the mid-range group where patients you know, could possibly do as well overall survival uh, without using the chemotherapy. So it is, it is of concern. Uh, there's a lot of studies that are being done on exercise and other things that can be done uh, to help women maintain strong heart function. Okay, we'll keep moving on.
So our next speaker is Andrew Cross. She uh, got her medical degree at the University of Alberta. And subsequently, she did a residency there and came to NCI as a clinical fellow. Now she's a staff clinician, and she's going to talk to us about radiation oncology. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, let's see. Okay, so we're just loading it up, so it'll just be a few seconds here. I had to fix one slide for this. Right, cool. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm a staff clinician in radiation oncology. Um, I'll be talking to you guys today about uh, the role of radiation oncology in uh, cancer treatment and some of the details about how radiation oncology plays a role and how um, it is being administered and a little bit of the science behind it. So I'll try and get through my slides fairly efficiently and if at any point in time you have a question, please raise your hand and let me know. Uh, alternatively, you can also wait until the end. I know you have uh, a handout with the slides and there's one mistake in there, uh, which I'll draw your attention to now. So it's on uh, your last slide. It should state the patient is not radioactive. So maybe that's, that's an important point to note off the bat. Okay. So briefly, um, I think to make the most of our time, uh, I think if you walk away with a general understanding of what the radiation oncology process is and uh, the important um, co-disciplines that are associated with it, I think that would be probably the most you can get from this. Um, we're a specialty that deals with radiation physics as well as radiation biology that are integral parts of how radiation is being administered and how it works, which I'll get to in a second. But I'll give you guys a little bit of an overview of radiation oncology terminology and the role of radiation in cancer. So I broke it up into, into three parts. The first part is the process of how radiation therapy is being administered, so you have an idea of what happens. Um, and then the next part is really the science behind this, whether it's your biology and physics, and the last part is the role in cancer. So briefly, there's a few questions on your guys' handout, which I don't expect you guys to know the answer to, but I think in reading them, you may, you may think a little bit about uh, some of the details that surround our specialty, and hopefully, as I explain to you some of these, it'll, uh, it'll make a bit more sense. So I'll actually go back to these uh, at the end and, um, and see if, if you guys uh, understand a little bit better uh, what we're about. So radiation treatment planning software, which um, I'll have a few slides on, um, is uh, in part, in great part, responsible for how we plan and treat patients. And once you guys see some plans, I'll go back to these questions. Um, I'd like you to remember the term IMRT. It stands for Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, and it's, it's a it's an important term in radiation oncology because uh, a great proportion of uh, treatments do occur using this technique, and I'll show you guys what that entails. And I'll go a little bit into the discussion as to how we fractionate or split up the radiation dose in order to treat our patients uh, and explain to you what hypofractionation is. And finally, we'll go through some techniques, so we'll go back to this at the end. Okay, so the process of um, administering radiation to a patient so you guys have an understanding. Um, 
there's a number of professions that are involved in radiation oncology. They involve radiation therapists, dosimetrists, and physicists. And um, as a radiation oncologist, generally what that involves is that you have medical training, and that may come in a few different types, whether it's medical, surgical, or for that matter, transitional. And then you have a residency, which is generally four years long, and then you have um, a fellowship, which, as, as you can um, as you can see, there can be uh, in different subsites that you might treat, especially the ones that require an advanced set of technology or an advanced skill set or are procedural in nature. And uh, you have some board exams and uh, a board certification. In some countries, um, radiation oncologists are actually trained in both radiation oncology and medical oncology. In other words, they can also prescribe or administer chemotherapy. But generally in uh, Canada and the United States, it tends to be just radiation oncology by itself. So what happens? When a patient is referred to radiation oncology, you see them in consult. So you see them in a clinic, you examine them, you take a good history, um, and then you go on to take um, to review all their imaging and to scan them in order to plan their treatment. And um, then uh, you evaluate the plan, you ensure the plan is going to be administered appropriately, and then you start them on treatment and subsequently you follow them up. So the consult, this is when the patient comes to the clinic. So you do a history of physical exam, um, you look at all the imaging that they have had to date, all the treatment that they have had to date. Uh, very important for us is where they have had prior radiation therapy to the area that you may be uh, asked to treat. That's very important because there is uh, those tolerances to organs that are present in the way of the radiation beam, so we need to know if they've had previous radiation therapy and to where, what dose, how long ago, that's important. So this is why that always requires records. So that sometimes may be difficult to obtain or they may complete, but it's very important to have. There are also certain conditions uh, that preclude the administration of radiation therapy, such as, uh, as you can see uh, on there, so stereoderma, inflammatory bowel disease, or DNA repair syndromes. So that's important because uh, radiation therapy, of course, interferes with repair of DNA. After all, that is a great portion of how we achieve an effect. So if uh, the patient already has a DNA uh, repair syndrome, then that would, um, of course, uh, increase the effect of radiation therapy and would cause significant toxicity. So we look at organ safety. That means that if you're going to treat lung, you must make sure that the lung is functioning properly before you administer radiation therapy. If you're going to treat the kidney or you believe that the kidney may be somewhere in your field, then you must make sure that both kidneys are working, and if one is not working, then you must make sure you spare the one that they do have that is working. And then you consent the patient for treatment that looks something like this. Depending on the institution you work at, it may look differently. Essentially, it uh, stipulates the side effects of treatment. And they're broken down into two categories, what happens during treatment and what happens long term. So you can see, I'll try and show you here with the mask. Let's see. So on, uh, on this side here, you can see what happens during treatment, and here what may happen months, two years later. And that's sort of a good framework to have in terms of um, radiation treatment side effects, into which I'll go a little bit more detail in a second. What we also need, uh, that I think is, um, is one of the cornerstones of prior to administration of radiation therapies, that you must make sure that the patient has indeed cancer. Uh, and I, I know this sounds sort of obvious, but uh, there are certainly situations when you may be able to forego uh, having tissue diagnosis of cancer, but by and large, most radiation oncologists will not treat without tissue diagnosis of malignancy. So uh, this particular article here in the National Post is that of a case that was treated in uh, Canada, a patient who received full brain radiation treatment, in fact, did not actually have cancer, and there was a big lawsuit. So the abnormalities in the brain look like they could be metastatic disease. In this case, the assumption was made that the patient had lung cancer but the patient did not in fact have lung cancer. They had uh, a different condition for which radiation therapy would not normally be administered, for which they would have had a completely different treatment. And uh, they did have the side effects of radiation therapy that are uh, associated with whole brain radiation treatment, which the patient didn't need to have. So that means in most practical terms that when we suspect cancer, we get a biopsy and we prove that they have cancer first and foremost. So how do we plan a treatment? So what does that mean? So you bring the patient in, you do a CT scan, um, you acquire the images, and then um, you plan based on the CT scan that you have just acquired. And I'll show you pictures in a second. You can, um, 
uh, see here on the right hand side a mask that looks like a hockey goalie mask. So that mask is used to immobilize the head and the neck during treatment. Because the treatment is very accurate in nature, you must make sure that the patient does not move uh, because that would of course uh, obviate the need for a very accurate treatment if you have a lot of leeway in terms of patient movement. Um, you can also see here um, this, uh, this, this blue um, device here is called a backlog bag. So this is a bag that you can uh, suck the air out of so that it conforms the patient's shape. So it keeps them in that shape for treatment. So what happens is that um, you image the patient. In our day, uh, day and age now, it'll be a CT scan. Um, the CT scan can be done sometimes with contrast, depending on what structures you intend to treat. And um, if you treat an area or a structure that is likely to move, you may obtain a 4D CT scan, which acquires the movement of the person in real time. And then you can use that extent of, say, for a lung movement, you can use that extent to incorporate into your treatment planning. Okay, so the planning. So first and foremost, what's important here when you plan a, a, a patient's treatment is to decide, is this patient being treated with intent to cure or with intent to palliate? In other words, are you trying to treat in order to make a symptom better, such as pain, or uh, are they having obstruction, or are you treating them in order to cure? And that's important because the doses are very different, and um, sometimes the, the level of sophistication that you're going to use in your planning may be different also. And uh, fractionation means how you divide up your dose. So that is important because if you are treating with the intent to cure, your treatment course may be more prolonged, and you are going to give less dose in each treatment package. Now, if the patient you think you're treating with palliative intent and they only have weeks or months to live, in that situation, you are uh, more likely to use a shorter treatment course, i.e. give a higher dose within each treatment, and with the understanding that there's a possibility they may have higher toxicity, which would be late toxicity. In other words, they're not going to live to experience that toxicity. So this is important, the treatment that is very important. Uh, the radiation type uh, that you're going to use depends on whether the area that you treat is deep or superficial. Uh, and I'll show you some uh, more data on that in a second as to how you decide. And ultimately, you have to determine as a radiation oncologist what volume or what area are you going to treat and what, are you, what is important for you to spare. So there's different types of particles that you can use in uh, radiation oncology. For example, if you're going to treat a skin lesion, so it's something that's really superficial, you can use something like electrons or orthovoltage. I don't want to go into great detail with you guys about this, but I'm happy to answer questions if you guys have questions about this. The idea is that different particles will deposit those differently in tissues. So tumors that are superficial require for those to be deposited at the skin surface or immediately just within the skin surface. If you have a tumor that is very deep, Electrons or orthovoltage will do you absolutely no good because there will be no dose by the time you get to your deep tumor. It will all be deposited at the surface. So you have to be um, able to select the energy of the particle that you use in such a way that you can, in fact, reach the lesion and treat it with some margin in addition to the lesion itself. So. Uh, what do we actually do as radiation oncologists, other than see the patient, do a physical exam, and all the things I've already discussed with you guys, is that you need to contour. That, that, that means that you are going to, um, on the CT scan that you have acquired, in conjunction with the imaging that they have had prior to coming to you, you will now contour what the tumor, what you perceive the tumor to be, and then the next step, where you think the tumor might be, or the subclinical extent of disease that you don't yet see based on your knowledge of oncology, where you may think that the disease might spread. And you also need to contour or draw what is normal. And that is done in order to an attempt to spare it as much as you can. So what I alluded to are the target structures. So there's something called the GTV that stands for gross tumor volume. So that's the tumor that you can actually physically see or palpate. So if you have the patient in front of you and they have a tumor and it's on their arm and you can feel it, that would be already part of your GTV, or the gross tumor volume. Now, of course, you will have a scan, and you can see the tumor even better. The next step is to determine, OK, so where would this tumor spread? If it were to spread, would it go to lymph nodes? What tissue planes would it spread along? And that determines your CTV, or your clinical tumor volume. 
So the GTV by and large is, to most people, if you see a scan or you see a patient and, and, and you're able to examine them and feel the tumor or you see them on a scan, you will know the GTV is relatively, I will say, largely easy to appreciate what it is. So a lot of um, radiation oncologists may explain to you that the reason that we exist, that what we are paid for in reality is actually the CTV. The GTV is very obvious, is the CTV. Uh, what is the behavior of this malignancy and what do we need to include in order to ensure that if we treat this, especially, especially so with curative intent, that the tumor doesn't fail immediately adjacent to where your field stops. And then on top of that, you add another margin that's called a PTV. So that's a planning target volume. So that accounts for motion and variability within the treatment. So, how, so when you plan, um, it used to be that the planning used to be done in 2D. That's no longer the case. Um, 2.5D came after this and then came 3D. So this is what we have now is 3D. And I'll show you pictures. Uh, I've already alerted you to uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy. So that by definition will be done on a CT scan and will require complex planning technique. ARC therapy is a form of IMRT. Brachytherapy, which I'll show you pictures of, is um, treatment administered at a short distance. So with the use of needles, or um, probes or devices that are placed into or adjacent to the tumor itself. Okay, so you make a plan, you evaluate the plan, you replan if, um, if you feel that you have not adequately covered your tumor or administer too much dose to what you perceive are organs at risk that are in the field that you don't want to administer such a high dose to. So this, for example, is a head and neck plan. So this patient uh, has, has a head and neck uh, primary that uh, you can see here outlined in blue with the fat blue line. And the, the other lines that you can see here are what we call isodose lines, so lines of equal dose. So this shows you that the plan that you have created for this patient will administer about 90% of the dose in this area here with the cyan color. So it covers the volume that you intended to treat. Usually what you want is for your dose to cover at least 95% of the volume or your target. But as you can see, this is our star-shaped, if you appreciate here, the 20% line, see how it's almost star-shaped. So this defines what is called an IMRT plan, intensity modulated radiation therapy plan. This means that there's multiple fields, generally an odd number, five or seven. Each one itself is modulated to treat the tumor and spare what is normal around it hence intensity modulated radiation therapy. So you evaluate the plan analog to what I just explained to you about it being covered by the dose that you intended to give. Um, and then you obtain what's called a dose volume histogram. This in short shows you what percentage of what structure that you have contoured, like I explained to you, 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 you tell the computer you, what you want to treat and what you want to spare, what percentage of the dose is it receiving? And there's, of course, numbers that we stick to that we have literature on and evidence as to how much we can get away with before we can cause toxicity. We do not know for sure. The data is not great. But we have certain lines in the sand that we stick to in order to avoid causing the patient significant toxicity. And ultimately, what we do next is quality assurance. And this is a complex and long process, and it's especially complex in the case of IMRT. This requires physicists, therapists. Uh, what you see here, uh, this is called a phantom. So this um, is being used by the physicist in order to run through the plant as if you were treating a person, but you're not, and to see where you would deposit those. So to ensure that what you have planned is indeed what you would administer. And you start the treatment. While the patient is on treatment, you acquire imaging in order to make sure that you are treating them in the position that you intended them to treat them, so that nothing's changed. Or if your patient is being treated for a head and neck cancer and has lost massive amount of weight, that you're still treating what you intended to treat, and that you're not putting additional dose in structures that you want to spare. So uh, this is, uh, you see here a treatment machine and a treatment table. The table moves, uh, as you can see with the, from the arrows there. The gantry moves as well. So this is the gantry here, and, and, and it will move in order to administer uh, the radiation treatment depending on the field. And 
This is the imaging that I, that I was alluding to. So you can acquire, on the treatment machine, you, know, you don't only treat, you, you treat, but you can also acquire imaging. And the imaging can come in different kinds, depending on the machine that you have. The simplest imaging you can get is an X-ray type image, so it's 2D. Uh, and you can then superimpose the image prior to treatment with the one where the, the position that the patient is in at that moment in time. And you see, you see how here they're superimposed on each other, and you can actually move this little cross to toggle back and forth between the two images to make sure that they're superimposed correctly. For more complex plans, you actually acquire a CT scan. So this is an image from a cone beam CT that's, re that's acquired on the treatment machine itself. And it too is superimposed to your treatment plan. And you can now see whether the area you intended to treat, which in this case you can see is, are these multicolored um, outlines here, where they superimposed exactly where the patient is in that position that day. So if the patient loses a lot of weight, and now this is now here, you may find that you are putting additional dose into the spinal cord that you did not want, that you wanted to spare. As you can see, this is being spared at the moment, and that you may need to, in fact, replant the patient and recalculate. So this is why we image the patient. So side effects. Um, I think the simplest way to sort of remember radiation therapy side effects is that the side effects are generally localized to where you treat. So there's one exception to that, which is fatigue. So when you radiate, no matter what body part you radiate, it doesn't have to be brain, it could be an arm, a leg, what have you, the patient will be feeling more tired. And it's not maybe week one or maybe week two, but as the dose accumulates, that will happen. The, the rest of the toxicities are localized to where you treat. This is a localized treatment. So in other words, when people say hair loss, it means hair loss in the treatment area. It doesn't mean hair loss all over, as you would see, say, with chemotherapy. Um, where you treat, you might see some skin redness, some warmth, occasionally itching. It never really opens up and weeps. Very, very rarely, sometimes in skin folds with higher doses in a more obese patient, but generally not. Um, other fallacies, I think, is that radiation therapy will cause bleeding. It does not cause bleeding. Um, or dementia after whole brain radiation treatment is also not the case. Uh, again, other fallacies is that uh, if you were to treat a head and neck cancer, that you may cause uh, swelling of the pharynx, causing the patient to have a tracheostomy. That also does happen. And ultimately, that it causes a second malignancy outside of the radiation field. Keyword there is outside. So radiation therapy can cause another cancer in the treatment field. So in an adult, the likelihood of that is remote. It's about one to two per thousand. But it will, it will, if it does occur, uh, it is a different histology or a different type of cancer than what you were treating, but it would be in the field of where you are treating, and uh, it would have to be sufficient time from the time that you have actually administered your radiation treatment. So if it occurs within six months, that's not a secondary malignancy. That, that's probably just bad luck. Now, if it occurs five, ten years later, it's in the field, and it's something different than the original malignancy, that could very well be radiation-related. Okay, so briefly physics, um, where we treat, so the type, so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, we, with radiation therapy, we would be here under x-rays. Gamma rays are a byproduct of uh, x-ray production, so we do guard against that with our shielding, but it is not where we treat. So there are different types of radiation treatment, which I briefly alluded to earlier. I think the important part to understand is that depending on the particle that you are treating with, its ability to penetrate tissue varies. So here you see, for example, the alpha particle is stopped by a piece of paper. The beta particle is stopped by aluminum. Um, the gamma ray, which is a byproduct of X-ray production, is only stopped by concrete. So what we use, by and large, what's being used is photons. So this is artificially produced x-rays. You have a linear accelerator. You accelerate electrons against the target, produce x-rays, which comes out through this little door, which is then being targeted or modulated by these devices here, which I have a picture of in a second. You can also, of course, treat straight with electrons for superficial lesions, for example. 
By and large, when people say they're using external beam radiation treatment, it's external, it's photons. They may occasionally specify they're using electrons for a superficial lesion, for example. So just like I explained, so using photons, you can see where it come out, where it's, they come out here. So I wanted to show you. So this is basically the aperture where, where the beam would be coming out. And you can see this little step wise little ladder here. This is how you can modulate or adjust the beam. There are little leaves that move in and out. And you can lock the beam where you don't want it to go. Um, I went through this uh, a little bit in terms of electron therapy, which I explained to you guys is superficial for low depth. Photon therapy, deposit those deeper. So when you're not sure what might work for your lesion, you would probably use photons rather than electrons if you think it's deeper. And then there's particle therapy. Uh, this requires a specialized facility. So now we're talking proton, carbon. So there's a... Uh, um, Proton centers in the United States, uh, I think there are 10 at this point in time. Uh, they're expensive facilities. Protons deposit dose and tissue a little bit differently. The advantage of protons over photons, the simplest way to explain it is that they live less of a dose as they come in through tissue, will deposit the dose as you modulate it where you tell it to, and then will exit without leaving as, as, as much dose. Whereas photons will have a relatively lower dose at the skin surface, but will slowly peak deposit dose in tissue, and subsequently taper off. So what you see here, actually at the top, these are electron curves. So you see they deposit quite a higher dose at the surface, and that's, that's the intent for superficial lesions. Deposit the dose, drop off, and eventually taper off. As the energy increases, the area where the deposit dose is larger. Uh, briefly, how do we measure it? So, because this people ask me a lot. Um, so we measure when you administer radiation therapy for cancer or in general, even for benign conditions, it's measured in gray, not in rads. It used to be rads, but it's not rads anymore. That's not in SI unit. Um, so if you ever hear a dose of, say, 2005, that means 2,000 centigrade in five fractions or 20 gray in five fractions. And I've, I've given you a little table here so you have an, an idea of the doses that are being given for different conditions. And this... Um, alludes to the point that I, that I made at the beginning as to whether you're treating with the intent to cure or with the intent to palliate, because you can see a significant difference in how much dose you would be giving. So a significantly higher dose if you're treating with curative intent, you are more likely to be willing to accept toxicity as a result of your curative intent treatment, but less likely to do so in a palliative case. Briefly, radiobiology. So radiobiology is, is um, the science that governs how we think the tissues respond to radiation therapy. What it means is that we want to maximize the effect of radiation in terms of cancer killing and minimize the, the effect of radiation in terms of how it affects normal tissue. The way we do that is by dividing the radiation dose into little packages or fractions or treatments. So you don't give all your dose all at once in one treatment. That would cause significant toxicity. You may, in fact, achieve dose uh, response to the tumor itself, but you would also kill the patient. So what you need to do is walk the line between treating tumor and killing tumor and sparing normal tissue. So what this shows here, the idea is to explain to you that as we split up the dose into little packages, we can in fact move this curve over and in so doing spare normal tissue. What we want is uh, exploit the differential between what is responding quickly, such as tumor or what we call early responding tissues and late responding tissues, such as normal tissue. Same idea here. This is what I want to, so actually what I wanted to show here. So when you use um, heavier particles, you may see a, dur a, a dose response like this. Um, the advantage of being able to do this and get away with it is that they may deposit dose in tissue differently. In other words, that less normal tissue will see radiation. Four important things so in terms of, so radiobiology, if you want to reduce it to, to one set of concepts, it would be this, the four R's of radiobiology. They are repair, reassortment, reoxygenation, and repopulation. This means that you want to allow normal tissue to repair, and thus take advantage of the 
deficiency in terms of tumors for their ability to repair. That's how you create a difference between tumor and normal. Uh, reassortment, which means that you want the, as you kill the cancer cells, they move through a cell cycle and they reassort or redistribute, which we'll get to in a second, into phases of the cell cycle that are more radiosensitive or more likely to respond to radiation treatment. And then reoxygenation, which is the idea that as you radiate and you kill some of those cancer cells, some of them that were previously hypoxic and had no, no access to oxygen are now moving into areas that are oxygenated and in so doing become more radiosensitive. And finally, repopulation. So as they receive more oxygen and nutrients, they actually increase the ability to repopulate. So this is uh, what I was alluding to with repair. So radiation causes two types of um, damage. Uh, it causes single strand breaks and double strand breaks. It causes significantly larger amount of single strand breaks than double strand breaks. But it's the double strand that you want because those are least likely to be repaired. Particles, so when you use heavy like neutron, carbon, they cause significant damage, what we call uh, bulky adducts that are very difficult to repair, which is why they're so effective. This is the redistribution point that I mentioned. So we understand that cancer cells are more likely to be susceptible to radiation treatment in certain phases of the cell site, specifically the most radiosensitive in G2 and M. And I, I have this actually on the next slide here too. But what you want, so this is, they are most sensitive in M, then G2, and they are least or most radio resistant in S phase. So as you exert an effect with radiation therapy on cancer cells, they may continue to divide for some time, but they get stuck. So when they get stuck in G2 or in M, and you radiate them again with your next fraction, you're more likely to achieve cell killing. Reoxygenation, this is what I mentioned about the ability to have access to oxygen. So as you guys, I think, may know one of the hallmarks of cancer is also that they have less, that cancer cells, as they grow, proliferate, develop areas of hypoxia, which causes radio resistance. As you radiate, areas that previously did not have access to oxygen now will, do, will have access to oxygen. Oxygen fixes or makes permanent the effect of radiation therapy and in so doing can cause cancer killing. So reoxygenation is something that we want. This is a busy slide, but it's supposed to illustrate the interplay between various agents that can be used in order to manipulate signaling cascades that are integral to the development of cancer. Where radiation therapy comes in is that it has, as you guys have seen in previous slides, it has an implication in terms of its ability to impair DNA repair. Uh, it will also impair proliferation, and so doing will cause cell death. A lot of these agents that are listed here have overlapping effects. Therefore, the idea is if you combine cytotoxic agents, whether they may be traditional chemotherapy or newer agents, you may achieve a better response than either entity by itself. I alluded to this a little bit. I mainly want you guys to focus on the pictures themselves because I think that's the easiest way to understand. So, you can see here on the right-hand side, this is how we used to plan radiation therapy. So you would, you would uh, acquire an X-ray and you would place your field just like so in a two dimension, and you would say, I want to treat from here to here and here and there and block everything else. Uh, we no longer do this. Um, the next step was to acquire an image, but then sort of plot where the dose would go even by hand. Now we acquire a CT scan, and in three dimensions, we determine what volume we want to treat and what we want to spare. And it looks something like this. So here you can see the tumor, and you can see how the beams would be treating this tumor, and it has a different aperture at each point or each angle. So intensity modulated radiation therapy, I think, is sort of an important uh, concept to have an idea of, because I think it'll become increasingly used. Um, this technique requires a lot of work, both on the part of radiation oncology as well as the physicists and the entire system, because it requires a lot of quality assurance. It requires a lot of volumes to be contoured or drawn. 
The idea is, as I explained, that you use a number of beams, each one of which is modulated or adjusted to conform to a volume. So this picture, I think, illustrates that quite well, because you can see that this beam here, for example, would have this outline. This one, yet different, and so on. And they, they change in real time as you treat the person. So in so doing, you can envelop your tumor in a dose cloud, which means that you can spare things that may be around the tumor that you do not want to put those in, or that you can put less dose in as a result. An example here is treat the tumor to 50 gray, but keep the bladder dose to 20. If the tumor is next to the bladder, without IMRT, that may not be possible. IMRT isn't always the best technique. Um, it is expensive. It is, uh, as I mentioned to you guys, very uh, complex. And it sprays dose everywhere, because you now, instead of having two beams, you might have five or seven. So it comes at a cost. These techniques here, cyber knife, tomotherapy, and gamma knife, all represent forms of IMRT. Uh, I know it can be confusing, but the idea behind them is the same. Arc therapy, for example, is another example of IMRT. Here you have an arc, or several, that is, you, develop, you uh, deposit the dose as the machine rotates in an arc around the patient. Bracket therapy, well, this one's different. So up until this point, what I mentioned to you guys was all external beam. So the beam is coming from the outside, goes through the patient in and out, speed of light. Bracket therapy is different, and then you're actually placing the radiation source next to the tumor, within the tumor, or in a body cavity. So where you get this the most is cervix, so, so sorry, uh, gynecology rather, so cervix, endometrial, vagina, and in head and neck cancers, especially as subspecialty centers, they can treat a lot of bracket therapy. Or uh, cancers that are really close to a surface. I have a picture here. For example, this is a lip cancer. This was treated with bracket therapy. So you place the source right within the tumor and treat it from the inside, as opposed to from the outside. Uh, the other two examples that you see here, this here is a, an example of plaque treatment for choroidal melanoma, so at the back of the eye. The alternative here would be enucleation or removing the eye. So this was a great advancement, and the outcome can be quite good. This here is a prostate implant, so a prostate gland implanted with radioactive seeds. What is important? Well, when you treat with external beam treatment, as I mentioned to you guys, the patient is actually not radioactive. There cannot be, by definition, of course. Radiation goes in and out, they leave the room, they're done. When you treat with bracket therapy in a manner like this, the patient actually is radioactive, because you're putting a radioactive source inside the patient. And as long as it decays over the course of its half-life, the patient will be radioactive. Um, so I think that's an important distinction to make. Newer modalities that I've already alluded to, so I think these are really nice pictures for you guys to sort of understand the differences. But you can see here, tomotherapy is based or analogous to how you do a CT scan, so a rotational movement when you administer radiation as the gant rotates around the patient. Cyberknife is a robotic arm that can move with multiple degrees of freedom around the patient, even as the tumor moves. Proton beam is a particle treatment that can be used as subspecialized centers. This is the one that I explained to you guys has a, an, at least a theoretical advantage or, on how it deposits dose. Gamma knife um, looks like this is a helmet with multiple apertures, and you can plan as to which apertures you're going to use and how you're going to administer your beam in order to contour your dose around the tumor. And then there's, of course, radiopharmaceutical therapy. Um, these are used for uh, certain malignancies or for um, metastatic disease with multiple areas of disease, like, for example, prostate cancer. Very briefly, fractionation, me this, this means how you do you divide your treatment. So hypofractionation means that you are going to administer larger doses per fraction. So what we call conventional fractionation, you give 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. If you give a higher dose than 2 gray per fraction, this is now hypofractionation. You are giving fewer fractions. The opposite of that is hyper. So you are now giving less dose per fraction, but you're giving more fractions. Other terms you might hear that I, I think people uh, can be confused about are IGRT, that's image-guided radiation treatment. And you already know what that means, because I showed you pictures. You essentially 
ensuring that you are imaging the patient while you're treating them to ensure that you are administering the treatment appropriately. SRS, that's stereotactic radiosurgery. Here, the idea is that you give a high dose to a small volume in generally one fraction. Hence, radiosurgery, because one fraction. When you say radiotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy, as opposed to surgery, the implication is that you're dividing in a few fractions, generally three to five. Um, SVRT, that's stereotactic body radiation treatment. Uh, this treats a small area to a high dose in a few treatments. So here you can see a, a comparison between uh, treatments that are 3D, how we used to treat and how we still do in certain situations, and in comparison to IMRT. This is where you have the multiple beams with a dose cloud that envelops the tumor that looks like a star. So the idea, I think, that you can take away from this if you look at these curves, you want to move these curves as far down this way as possible in order to spare any organs that are in the field that are not cancer, that you want to give as little toxicity to, to as possible. So what IMRT will do for you will um, enable you to envelop this tumor in a dose cloud while sparing potentially larynx, mandible, and these lines here represent other organs that are adjacent to, the, to your target that you are now giving less dose to in comparison to a 3D conventional treatment. Tomotherapy, I mentioned to you guys the form of IMRT. Again, you see the star-shaped type of dose distribution there. Uh, proton, the, the two lower pictures represent proton beam. And I, I try to explain to you guys that the point of proton therapy is that it, devol it, it deposits dose and tissue differently. So you can see how here, how it's very sharp at the edges and how there's almost no exit dose here. In comparison to this plan here, which is 3D, where you see all this dose here that's going all the way out, even here it's still 20% of the dose. The idea, what we call that is integral dose. So protons have one major advantage, which they develop less dose, they, they give less dose to normal tissue. So they have less integral dose. So you want to use protons for pediatric malignancies because children, especially generally with curative intense treatments, very important because they will be around a long time. So any area where you put dose could develop a secondary malignancy. So that's important in a child. It's important in adults as well, but adults especially as we age, um, in theory, we have less lifetime to develop a secondary malignancy. So it's very important in children or in tumors that are in bad places surrounded by a lot of organs that cannot receive a high dose. So I've alluded to this a few times. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see sites that are being treated with the intention to cure, such as prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Of course, all of the entities on the left-hand side can also be treated with palliative intent. If you have now metastatic disease and you have a patient with lung cancer, there may be a role to palliate with radiation therapy for bone pain, shortness of breath, neurologic symptoms, or uh, a space occupying lesion causing pain. There are some radiation oncology emergencies. There are not many, such as cord compression. This is when a tumor will press on the spinal cord. Um, similarly, when a tumor presses on nerves, such as cord equina syndrome, SVCO stands for uh, superior vena cava obstruction. So this can cause pressure on a vessel, which can cause swelling, shortness of breath, and potentially organ compromise, or airway obstruction, bleeding. Now, metastatic disease of the brain in and of itself is not an emergency in radiation oncology, but it does require treatment, as are the following conditions. I to. So here, you, this picture is supposed to illustrate for you, uh, this is, a, this is a, a tumor here that's pressing on the spinal cord, and you can see that here. So a situation like this could be managed surgically in some situations. Um, if surgery is possible, you would want for this patient to have surgery, but that would have to be followed with radiation therapy. In the event that the patient cannot have surgery or has multiple lesions or is unable to uh, undergo anesthetic, um, you could treat this with radiation therapy in order to diminish the size of the tumor, take pressure off of the nerves, and in so doing, prevent neurological compromise. Here you can see a big mass that's causing obstruction of the vena cava. So this patient is likely to present with significant swelling in the upper body, 
vessel prominence, shortness of breath. Uh, this situation can be an emergency. Uh, it can be treated possibly by stenting this area as an alternative with radiation therapy. Metastatic disease of the bones, so that's cancer spread to the bones, uh, can cause pain, um, can cause fracture. So this can also be an area where radiation therapy has a role with palliative intent. As is, as you can see here, airway obstruction. So here there's a tumor that's uh, compressing the right main stem bronchus, causing shortness of breath. Further growth of this tumor could cause a collapse of this lung and uh, oxygen dependency in uh, the patient. So this can, again, be treated with radiation palliative intent or potentially with curative intent, depending on the extent of disease. I think uh, an important take home point is the, that radiation therapy has evolved significantly, uh, even in just the last few years. So we moved from using um, a very simple collimator. This is the little door that I showed you guys in that picture where the beam is coming out, very simple. Now it is this type of collimator where you have this multiple small leaves that move in and out and can conform to a tumor. This is a really big deal and can significantly uh, uh, target, uh, help target your radiation therapy and give you that beautiful dose cloud where you can give the dose that you would like to your target and spare what's around it as much as possible. Uh, this is a type of blocking that used to be used called CeraVent that they used to actually cut. We still occasionally do this, but uh, since we have this now, hardly ever, it's a very simple palliative case that you might use something like this. Um, I uh, at length mentioned uh, uh, 3D CT scanning for treatment planning. So you acquire a CT scan in order to plan your treatment. It's not a simple x-ray. And you're using the um, CT scan in order to determine what dose is being administered to the structures in your field. And finally, uh, here I think this I, I explained to you about IMRT, but uh, I want you to, to draw your attention to this. I think possibly where the future may lead us is to functional imaging, where you can now uh, image the biology possibly of a tumor and then target that accordingly with your dose. So ultimately, um, depending on what statistics you look at, about two thirds of patients that have cancer receive radiation treatment at some point in their treatment. Most of the treatments that patients receive are external. Uh, there is, of course, I, I explained to you guys about brachytherapy. Um, generally, the patient is not radioactive. Of course, if you're implanting a radioactive source, such as in brachytherapy for prostate cancer, then they are radioactive. A lot of tumors require a multidisciplinary approach. That's very important because radiation therapy is not um, by itself. Uh, there are conditions where you administer radiation treatment alone, but increasingly there's a combination between radiation and chemotherapy or surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. It's an evolving field with physics and radiobiology heavily involved. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Kamphaus and Dr. Hagel and Dr. Coleman for some of their slides. And I'll be happy to take any questions. You could elaborate sure. on the use of radiation for surgery. Okay. Yeah, so there are several aspects there within that question. So difficult to treat is, so a, a brain tumor by definition is difficult to treat because it tends to be adjacent to organs that you can't put very much dose into, such as optic nerves, opticism, or brainstem. So it is physically difficult to treat and difficult to plan because you're trying to put 60 gray into this tumor while putting as little as possible into these adjacent structures. So we have constraints where, for example, the brainstem that's right next to the tumor cannot go over 60 gray either. The optic chasm, optic nerve is generally 54 or 55 gray. So you now have to tell your planning system, whether you use IMRT or whether you do a conventional planning, that you are now going to treat this area to 60 gray while sparing everything else or trying to minimize the dose to the other areas. So this means that we have to modulate our beams in such a way that we achieve that objective. So that's one aspect of your question. But the other aspect is that, which I think is even more important, is the question is that, so you achieve your 60 gray and you achieve your constraints to your organs at risk in the field, but your tumor fails because it does. We tell the patient this is curative intent, but this isn't, we, we know that this is not going to be curative intent. We do not, by and large, cure 
glioblastoma multiforme. They might live a long time. They might go through multiple surgeries, multiple interventions. But the point is that that 60 grade that you put in there didn't cure the tumor. So this is, I think, the more difficult aspect. While I think that we have, may have solved the first aspect very efficiently with the techniques that I showed you guys today, it is the biology that we have yet to get to the bottom of in order to achieve that, that superior response where the tumor does not fail in field. So when I say fail in field, it means that literally the tumor, more than 95% of the time, glioblastoma will fail within the field or right at the edge of your field. So in your high dose area, you achieved your, your objective of putting the dose there, but you did not achieve your objective of curing your patient. And that is because, presumably, there's multiple mechanisms of radioresistance. There's also a significant heterogeneity uh, in terms of the biology of these tumors. And that's true for most tumors, not just glioblastoma multiforme. But that is one entity where we believe there's multiple different entities within that category, some of which may be more radioresistant and others more radiosensitive. Incidentally, as I alluded to with that other slide, radiation therapy is combined with chemotherapy in that particular instance. And that has been shown the combination has been shown to improve survival. So you achieve that synergy that I mentioned to you guys in terms of combining the effect of radiation therapy and that of another agent. But it is unfortunately not sufficient to produce a cure. So it's a multifactorial problem, of which the planning, I think, is the least problematic at this point. So the actual nitty-gritty of planning and administration is not really the problem. It's the biology, I think, that we haven't solved. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first of all, it depends what sort of radio, so what radioactive source have you used? What is the half-life of it? Where have you put it? Um, so in the case of prostate cancer, like the picture that you guys saw with the seeds in the prostate gland, so you actually provide the patient uh, with an entire list of um, recommendations as to what they can and cannot do. So that'll mean to them that um, you, you counsel them, first of all, about seed migration, because seeds can actually migrate. So on occasion, we see, you may see one of those little seeds that look like a little pencil lead. That's the size they are in, in a lung. They get stuck in tiny blood vessels in the lung, which is why you do a chest X-ray on your patient about a month after you you put the seed implant in. Uh, for example, in that situation, for seed migration, you don't do anything different. You tell the patient, we think we see a seed there. It hasn't been associated with increased malignancy of the lung. Other precautions. So you need to discuss with them to not be around. So th the most radio radiation susceptible people are developing organs. So that means what? Pregnant women, young children. So they have to be we tell them generally to stay away from pregnant women for at least three months, to not be in close proximity, to not keep the grandchild on their lap, because these are developing children that are, that are more susceptible to the effect of radiation therapy. Uh, in terms of their life partner, um, they are able to share a bed. So people have done calculations. So if they sleep about one meter apart um, for, while the patient has the seed implant present, the partner would receive about as much radiation as flying uh, from New York to Paris. Um, so really, because flying, as I think you guys know, is associated with exposure to ionizing radiation. So this is how much the partner would receive. So in other words, it's not a big issue, but they, you do counsel the person. Um, if they have intercourse, they're going to have to use a condom because there's a risk of, again, seed migration or movement. You don't want them to deposit the seed into the partner. So um, those are some of the, the issues. Of course, uh, you have to counsel them. You know, they, God forbid, they die and they have an autopsy performed. Um, that tends to be a big issue for, uh, of course, over the pathologist because there's now radiation exposure, so they have to uh, have uh, lead protection. And uh, there's a lot, so there's, it's a long, long list of precautions. If you give somebody radioactive iodine, so for, say, like for thyroid cancer, there's an entire set of precautions there. It depends on the dose you give. For some doses, you actually have to keep them admitted for 24 to 48, sometimes 72 hours until they're, until they're no longer, or, or the level of radioactivity is sufficiently low that you can't release them. If you release them home, they have to stay, uh, they have to have their own room. They have to use the, so um, toilets and so on have to be used only by that person. They cannot share any, um, any food or cutlery or any 
body fluids with another person for at least seven days. So it's, uh, it's, it's complex, but it's totally dependent on the half-life of the isotope that you used and where you put it. Did I just 